And hello again from WJ Live, powered by the Western Journal. I'm Josh Manning, Deputy Managing Editor for the Western Journal. Joining me on the show today, Tara Snyder. She is an assignment editor at the Western Journal and Grant Adkinson, <laughs> who is a reporter at the Western Journal. Uh, thank both of you guys for being on here this afternoon. And thank you for joining us on this Friday afternoon. We're going to wrap up the week by looking back at some of the most interesting stories of the week. Uh, there may be a couple stories in here that you haven't even heard of. Uh, so let's just take it straight from the top. We want to go to Loudoun County, uh, Virginia. Loudoun County, I think, is one of the counties that's going to actually, the narratives coming out of that county are actually going to help carry us to a victory in 2022 because the left has so incompetently managed local government there. And um, we've seen a lot with school boards there. I can't remember if we've seen anything with uh, uh, with uh, uh, city councils or those sorts of things. But now we're seeing issues with the judiciary mm -hmm. there as well. And so as if the problems they've had aren't enough, uh, Tara, take it away. Tell us what's going on. What's happened this week? Yeah. So this week uh, in Loudoun County, we we saw some new stuff that was coming out just about what was going on with the young man who identified as a woman by putting on a skirt and walking into girls' bathrooms. Um, he reportedly or actually was convicted of raping two of his classmates who were about 15 years old. And he was convicted of that. And everyone was like, oh, thank God. Like, that's really good. We wanted that to happen. And then the news came out uh, late last night that the judge in Loudoun County decided that because he was 15 and because the prosecution didn't explicitly file to have him labeled as a um, as, oh my gosh, what's it called? A sex offender that that was just not going to go on his record. So yeah, apparently you're old enough to rape two young girls, but not old enough to be put on the sex offenders registry, which is just insane. And it's really, really stupid when you consider that the the judge in the case herself um, called his psychological evaluation scary. She said, it scared me. I'm scared for you. It scared me for society. So apparently when a sitting court judge who deals with criminals every day can look at this kid's psyche eval and go, that's terrifying. That's scary. Apparently that's not enough to put them on a sex offenders registry. And I was actually kind of interested as to what actually goes into a psyche eval because, I mean, everyone can talk to any other person and kind of go, oh, that person seems a little off their rocker. <laughs> but I was actually just looking to see what actually takes place during a psyche eval. And this is what I found. So they look at your uh, mental health history. They'll ask you um, about any symptoms you had, what your personal family history is, like if your family's had any other mental health issues, any psych psych uh, psychiatric treatments you've had. Uh, they look at your personal history. Have you been arrested? Are you married? What sort of work do you do? Um, and then they do a more mental evaluation, looking at your thoughts, your feelings, day-to-day -day life. Are you irritable? Are you shy? Are you aggressive? And this is all from WebMed. So they go through the entire thing, and then they actually go and do a cognitive evaluation, and they look at your, uh, your reasoning, uh, whether or not you have a, a strong memory, and things like that. So they don't actually list out the questions from what I'm seeing, but I do think it's really, really concerning that a sitting <laughs> judge can look at the, the written analysis from psychologists and go, this is really scary and I'm worried for society. So I just think that that is completely ridiculous, especially in the era of coming out of, oh, Me Too and all of these movements yeah. and stuff with with uh, with uh, progressivism. Um, but I just think it's a really, really interesting thing because the left has always tried to be a champion of women with the Me Too movement and feminism. But now you see again where these two young girls mm. and their families, they said they were heartbroken over the news mm. today. Then you see these things with trans swimmers and them taking women's sports. So uh, what do you think uh, just with all of this going on? Do you think that the technicality should have allowed this young man to not be put on this list? I don't. And that's exactly what the father of the first victim was saying. So this kid actually, he was accused of sexual assault at one school, transferred to another school, and then accused of sexual assault at that school. Yeah. The first school is the one where he was wearing a skirt and went into the women's bathroom and like mm -hmm. you said, he's been convicted of sexual assault, but he's not going to go on the sex offender registry list. And the reason is, as you mentioned, because the prosecution didn't file a motion 
saying that they wanted him to go on the sex offender registry. So the judge actually initially called for him to go on the sex offender registry. Then the defense team said, well, wait a second, you can't do that because they didn't file a motion asking you to do that. And apparently that's technically true. So the judge was forced to say he doesn't go on the sex offender registry. So he basically is getting off because of a technicality. And the Daily Mail actually spoke to the father of the first victim. And he said, you know, I don't have the exact quote, but this is ridiculous. I can't believe it's a technicality. And now, you know, women are going to have to be scared. Their parents are going to have to be scared for their kids because this guy could be roaming around and you won't know where he is because he doesn't have to register. Teen girls will be scared. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. This I didn't realize. I thought this was the judge's call. I didn't realize that this was the prosec- prosecution that botched this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That So that is remarkable. Um, man. And there are so many issues with prosecutors in America right now. We've got federal prosecutors, U S attorneys who are dropping charges against BLM rioters and, uh, Antifa people left and right. Uh, We've got prosecutors who are not filing charges when they need to file charges that would land people in jail and keep them off the streets. And then we've got those people turning around and robbing, raping, or even murdering other people. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've got liberal politicians who are passing um, um, cash bail laws that allow people to get, I mean, it basically turns prison, uh, turns jail into a revolving door. Uh, and then you've got prosecutors who, I, I mean, presumably these guys, you know, wanted to do the right thing, but they somehow failed to file the paperwork. I mean, how do you explain that to to the public that elects you? Yeah, exactly. And the judge actually said something to the effect of if they had filed that, that the the boy probably would have had to go on the sex offender registry. But because they didn't, the defense is right that the, she can't force him to do that. So it's a complete mistake by the prosecution that that is staggering because there's no tell. Well, a couple of things. First off, uh, the kid can move and be in a new school system, make new friends and be going over to other kids homes. And the parents and, and have no know idea his name or his picture because he's, oh, a, yeah, minor, he's so a minor. He so identified. he's totally anonymous. This yeah. is uh, if you're going to rape somebody, this is the scenario because yeah. this kid, he can, you know, he's he's essentially it looks like he's going to get away with it or with very um, with yeah. very few consequences. But, you know, I have a I have a 15 year old and a 13 year old. And they have their friends over to the house all the time. Somehow we ended up being the, the <laughs> ours ended up being the house that everybody comes to, which is nice because we know where our kids are. <laughs> um, but we have kids in the house all the time who we're just meeting. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, if there are other kids who get the kind of treatment this kid got, you know, I mean, they could show up in my house and I wouldn't have any idea yeah, who know. they are. You'd have no idea. And we live in a pretty small community that polices itself fairly well. We've got a, a Facebook group, and if if uh, a sex sex offender moves into the the town, we normally post on there, and so everybody knows who the person is. But in this case, you'd have no idea yeah. who this kid is. Um, I, I guess if he's male and comes to your house wearing a skirt, that and could then be maybe a, you would know. could be like, all right, this could be him. Um, but of course, there's no telling how many people do that. So um, anyway, and it's so. It is so unbelievably dangerous for kids in this world right now. Anyway, I, I can't remember if I actually told you guys the story or not. I I know I haven't told it on the air. So a couple weeks ago, I came home and there were a couple of teen boys on my doorstep and they were asking where my son was. And I thought they were just friends of his. And I said, Oh, well, he's, he's not here. He's down over here. And they, they, um, they then proceeded to, accuse him of um, improper sexual content uh, contact with a friend of theirs. Oh, my gosh. And I, okay, so I didn't tell you guys this. So anyway, she was claiming all kinds of stuff had been done. She claimed she had pictures, all of this. And I told him, all right, we'll send the pictures. Let's see if there are any pictures. The picture she sent was her sitting on a couch with him. And this had, they had been in my house. So this was somebody who had no problem setting up another person lying about lying about something sexual that had happened. And these kids, my son's 13. Whoa. I think she was 13. I I mean, this is a crazy, crazy world that we are living in where you've got 15 year olds cross-dressing, raping people in the opposite sex's restroom. 
and then 13 year olds like, falsely accusing other 13 year olds of, of uh, sexual, I guess not molestation, of sexual harassment, contact, whatever it would be. Um, I mean, you know, they, the old thing is that in the 50s, the biggest problem in schools was chewing gum and talking <laughs> in class, you know? Yeah. And now it's getting raped in a bathroom yeah. by someone who is gender confused. Um, I mean, this is, it is terrifying what society has has kind of devolved into. Yeah. Wow. I don't have any thoughts other than that. Yeah. Um, so, so the kid, do you, do we know what next steps are for the kid? I mean, he's, he, the, he's not a sex offender. He has to be in a locked residential facility until he's 18 and he's 15 right now. So it'll be about three years. He'll have to be not in a jail per se, but it's a juvenile rehabilitation center. Yeah, and so and nothing bad sexually ever happens in those places. <laughs> yeah. So that's e he's either going to be a victim in there or he's going to further yeah. offend. Um, yeah. And and maybe not. You know, we don't know that, but we do know that there are enormous issues and in, in but places then presumably like when he that. gets out, there won't be really any other consequences for him because yeah. he's not a registered offender yeah. so he can just go do whatever he wants once he turns 18 i guess yeah so this is we talk about this from time to time but i i i think it was madison's observation that you know a, a democracy which I, I get it we're not a democracy we're a republic we're kind of a republic wrapped in a democracy but a a democracy can't exist without a religious people and what madison was saying was essentially a virtuous people mm -hmm. or even a christian people and as we have fallen farther and farther and farther away from, as we've gotten farther and farther and farther away from faith and more toward the secular and the postmodern, um, this, I mean, you can see this stuff has risen just radically, yeah. radically. Uh, and it's, and it's terrifying. And there's not really a good courthouse or white house solution to this. The, the solution really is in the church house. Um, all right. Well, spe hey, check this segue out, folks. <laughs> Speaking of sex offenders, <laughs> remember how Kyle Rittenhouse shot a guy who had been convicted of raping yeah, I think it was kids convicted. twice, yeah. I think, if I remember correctly. Um, so Rittenhouse was uh, was interviewed recently by Candace Owens, and uh, he made a couple of comments in there that really made news. And in fact, a uh, piece that we ran on that went super like hyper viral earlier today. It was one of the best pieces we've done. And I don't know how long. Uh, so Grant, take it away. tell us what's going on there with Rittenhouse. Yeah. So basically, like you said, most people would know at this point that Kyle Rittenhouse, you know, had to face trial because he was forced to kill two men in self-defense. The judge ruled that it was self-defense. He was not guilty on all counts. All that happened, which is great. He got justice in the courts. But at the same time, during this trial, there were people both celebrities and media and all these people on the left who are trying to drag his name, basically trying to imply that he was guilty before the verdict was being read. One of those people notably was LeBron James, the NBA star who is a great basketball player, not as great of a politician. And he <laughs> tweeted um, something to the effect of Kyle Rittenhouse not crying. I actually have the quote right here. I'll read it for you. He said, quote, what tears? I didn't see one man. Knock it off. That boy ate some lemon heads before walking into court. This was in response to a video of that, Kyle Rittenhouse crying during the trial. That is an astute <laughs> assessment. So he, he obviously ate some lemon heads. He wasn't actually crying. He was Moronic. faking it. Obviously, the, the assumption here is that Kyle Rittenhouse is guilty. He's trying to make it look like he's going through these emotional, this emotional time because he's trying to you know, make his case look better. And there was just so much of this coming from the media, coming from celebrities, coming from sports figures. I mean, all over the place. And so Rittenhouse, like you said, went on Candace Owens' show this week, and he was talking about this. And Candace Owens said, quote, I remember when they read the verdict, and I was obviously very happy with the verdict, and I was just so angry at the people like LeBron James who were kind of feeding this narrative that wasn't true. And she went on to say it felt like, when they read the not guilty verdict, that was like justice part A, but there mm. still needs to be a justice part B mm. for these people like LeBron James mm. and for mm. the media yeah. who are dragging him. And so she asked him, is that going to come? And his response was simply, there is going to be some accountability. So a lot of people were quoting dun, that, dun, dun. thinking about what that may mean. It does sound a little ominous. So I'm just curious what you guys think. Um, what kind of a case does he have 
against LeBron and just against the media, what kind of legal action do you think he could take? I mean, I'm honestly not sure what kind of legal case he has against LeBron other than LeBron, like, ultimately just looking dumb and stupid and um, not really full of grace at all. Uh, I think the one case he can really, really go for is when Joe Biden put him in a Mm. montage of people he labeled white supremacists. Like, I see the clear-cut case right there. I mean, but but what do you (laughs) say? Like, oh, LeBron James said I looked like I had lemon heads on the stand. It's like, okay. Like, I don't know what the legal precedent is for that, but I would definitely go after Joe Biden, which is what I'm more excited for. Yeah, I think the LeBron case is not... As strong of a legal case, it's more just LeBron looks dumb now because yeah. he's wrong. But that is an interesting point. Joe Biden, can you imagine the president of the United States being, you know, sued for defamation? That would be a very interesting be case. Spectacular. Um, I, yes, I, I love the idea. Kyle Rittenhouse, the most unsuccessful white supremacist ever. <laughs> he only shot white people. White pedophiles. White pedophiles. Yeah, <laughs> white, white. I don't know if they were all pedophiles. At least one, one at of least them one was one a pedophile. <laughs> I think the other, another one was an abuser, right? Was yeah, a, yeah, like, like a domestic abuser. Abuse, abuse, yeah. And then the other one, I'm not sure. And and I just, I I will go to my grave just remembering that wretched, morally bankrupt DA who told Rittenhouse, again, who's 17, a minor, that sometimes you just have to take it. Sometimes you just <laughs> have to take a beating. And the guy, who, the, the person who's going to take it from was a child rapist. Sometimes you just got to take it from a child rapist, kid. Sorry. Oh, yeah. That's you, the way that's the way justice works can, now. Can you imagine, too, like the women's the women's march movement? If they said that to like a woman who is like being oh, attacked yeah, by a rapist. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, sometimes that just happens. Sometimes you just got to take it from Harvey Weinstein. Yeah, there you sometimes go. Yeah. you just got to take then it. I think more people would probably be outside. Marching it's outrageous. Streets, it's you know? absolutely outrageous. But he was given cover. For all of the, I don't remember the, I don't remember any mainstream outlet. I'm not sure I remember any outlet other than us um, covering that angle that this guy is a child rapist. Now people talked to him. Mainstream media outlets had him on and interviewed him. Um, the not the guy who was shot and yeah. not killed. And yeah, he yeah. was also a criminal. Yeah, and they had him on and interviewed him and made it seem like he was a well, martyr. He's the victim. He's yeah. the victim. It's so reverse. So the media gave that. Pro- Gosh, I wish I could remember that prosecutor's name because I would like to use his name in relation to this as much as possible. He. I hope it's on his grave. I told a minor he needed to take it from a child rapist. That needs to be on his tombstone. Um. Uh, yeah, but because the media was giving so much cover, he could get away with saying yeah. something that horrible, and nobody except except essentially conservative media called him out on it. Certainly, the legacy media didn't. Yeah, well, and it's like we it's so funny because we talk about these like horrible prosecutors, but Binger was just laughable. Like there were memes coming out about Binger. Like Babylon B was putting out stuff about him. He had his little Sherlock Holmes pin. And the most iconic thing ever is it's like it reads like satire because he goes, So the gas station was on fire and you were running towards it. Why? And Kyle Rittenhouse goes, It there there was a fire. <laughs> and it's like, what? These That's- are like spineless, <laughs> feckless people who can't conceive can't conceive of taking matters into their own hands and trying to help someone. Yeah, yeah. These are people who see a car accident happen, a, somebody get T-boned right in front of them, and instead of stopping to help them, they lay on the horn and roll around them. That's oh, what these prosecutors no. are. Oh, yeah, and it's like, it's funny even speaking of that, because like when my dad got in a crash, all the cars that were there all left, no one left, and it was like two or three minutes later when another lady happened to drive by and see the crash and was like, Oh, I guess I'll pull over and help. You know, yeah. so it's just crazy that yeah. as a society, that's like what we've yeah, that's just checked to. out, and somebody yeah. else will take Some, care of it. Else's yeah, problem. somebody else will do it. But I, I think the only legal action here is possibly from Lemonhead. Uh, I think the Lemonhead candy people should sue LeBron for dragging them into this. Yeah, silliness. they weren't a part of this. They didn't do anything to deserve that yeah. kind of. <laughs> yeah, How they did, did they? nothing. And also, do they make you cry? I don't remember Lemonheads ever sweet. making me cry. I, I don't yeah. know if LeBron like just has them. a really low like sour tolerance, but they're really not that sour. <laughs> Well, he he seems to have, sorry, LeBron, he seems to have a low pain tolerance, too, because this is a dude (laughs) who can get bumped. And I don't even follow sports, guys. 
but he can get just just nudged out there and all of a sudden he's on the ground in horrible pain oh, yeah. and he's mocking this kid who's been through however many months of absolute hell with people calling him a racist calling him a bigot calling him a white supremacist mm -hmm. saying he murdered people blah 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 the kid held it together until the very end starts crying and then lebron comes out and acts like he's a wimp yeah I, I mean and 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 Rittenhouse he doesn't look like a very big guy maybe he is but he looks like a fairly small guy and so LeBron this giant giant NBA well, definitely player smaller than LeBron yeah yeah this giant NBA player is making fun of this kid for crying when this giant hulk of a man <laughs> cries you know at the drop of a hat it's yeah embarrassing he should be embarrassed by it yeah and I think did he never deleted the tweet, did he? No, he didn't. We pulled it up. He still has it on his Twitter. I was trying to remember if he acknowledged it somehow or not. I, I can't remember. It's definitely still on his Twitter. I don't know if he apologized, but. Well, he he certainly should have. Um, all right. So we're talking about stories that uh, you may have missed this week. We talked about the Loudoun County prosecutor. We just talked about the Rittenhouse interview. Now we want to talk about, it's actually my favorite story of the day, uh, Joe Biden, and I'm sure you've seen this part, uh, Joe Biden has said he will nominate, he will definitely nominate, he will certainly nominate a black woman to the Supreme Court. Now, I just delight in this because by saying that, Biden has literally said, Biden has said, figured, figuratively said, no, Lat Latinos need not apply, Grant. Yeah. Latinos need not apply. Asians need not yeah. apply. All of these minority groups, other than African Americans, need not apply. And guys, I can't for the life of me figure out how that's not racist. Well, what I think is really interesting is like we recently had MLK Jr. Day, right? You have all these Democrats saying, oh, the Republicans they're tarnishing the legacy of MLK Jr. because they're not voting for this voting rights package. They're not doing this. They're not doing that. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke extensively about not identifying people mm. for a job or for anything yep. based on their race. And leftists today don't like that. They don't like this idea of colorblindness. Yep. They like the idea of saying we're only going to hire a black person. Yep. That's completely antithetical to what MLK stood for. And the Democrats who say the Republicans are the one tarnishing his legacy, they are clearly missing that. Uh, Tora, is this, am I missing something or is this just straight up racism? It, it's, it's just kind of it's acceptable racism. It's just completely ridiculous. And like, there's this satire, like, I know I've shown you the video a couple times where it's like woke and racism. And it's like, mm. we only look through, look at things through the lens of race. And that's exactly no. what Joe Biden's doing. And I mean, we've seen the nightmare that Kamala Harris has reigned on the country, just like the most unlikable VP in all of history at this point. And that was what he said when he chose her is that it had to be a black woman again. Mm. And it's just like, it's, it's just Does Joe sad. Biden have a thing for black women? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, and it's just sad because it's like, more at 10. Why would you want to be chosen based on something like that? Like, I wouldn't mm. want to be chosen based on how embarrassing, like how so humiliating. Because it's like who uh, he that takes he shouldn't have said anything. Like he probably could have just thought that yep. himself. Yep. Because if he was like, yep. oh, I'm gonna name like Michelle Obama, whatever. Yep. Then everyone's like, oh, Michelle Obama, she ruined kids' lunches, yay. <laughs> and they like would look at least at the resume of the person and not just be like, oh, yeah. well, at least Michelle yeah. Obama's a black woman, and we know that's why she was chosen. And it's like it's stupid because if Joe Biden were in this room right now and he were looking at Supreme Court pick, I already beat you guys out by just being a girl. You know, yeah, and you're already has, more minority it, groups than we yeah, are. Yeah, and so. it has more nothing to do. It has nothing to do with the fact that, like, whatever, like that you're pro the most probably qualified of anyone, and all of this stuff. It's like you immediately shut off the shut off mm. everything. You know, it's just so it's so ridiculous. And, and to be clear, if Joe Biden were in the room, he would also be sniffing your hair. Oh yeah, I think he would probably actually be playing with my very shirt, creepily. So. <laughs> shiny <laughs> now i rub your shirt um <laughs> terrible joe biden impersonation <laughs> so um yeah so grant why then tara's got a great point he should have just waited and announced the name why did he go ahead and say this because the left has made it to where it's not embarrassing it should be if you mm. if you are a black woman and joe biden says i'm gonna nominate a black woman and then he nominates you 
because of your race and your gender, then that should be embarrassing. You should say, oh, I would rather be nominated for my qualifications. Oh. But the left has set up this this world where yeah. being nominated because you're a black woman is not embarrassing. That's something to be proud of. Yeah. Well, oh, that's good. And, and it's so funny because I was just, I was reading in the news earlier that the Supreme Court is supposed to look at the Harvard um, like class yeah. action for oh. affirmative action. And now people are literally getting appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States of America based <laughs> on affirmative action. This person should like, recuse herself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's she like, was it's a like, product of yeah, affirmative action. It's like, oh, sorry, I'm going to take a step back now. Like it's, it's like, oh, well, it's so uh, mind boggling. It's yeah, so and crazy. you mentioned you know other minorities like Asian people have had a hard time getting into schools because the affirmative a hard time action, getting into Harvard. Yeah, the affirmative action policies you know they don't count for them. It only no. counts for other minorities. And you're seeing the same thing on the Supreme Court, like you said. Like, what's the difference in if he nominated an Asian woman or a Latina woman? Like, there's there's other minorities and they're being ignored because he's just trying to focus on black people because that's what is politically beneficial to him. Yeah, he yeah. wants to shore up there. And and they know, I mean, they're not idiots. Uh, Democrats know that the black vote is far more in jeopardy at this point than it has been since, uh, well, the 50s. Well, and it's so it's so stupid, too, because if you're Justice Breyer, like, I just, like, want to take a minute to think about the fact where it's like, you better resign right now because you may die at an inconvenient time. And how dare you? Like, You're depriving a, a black woman of a job. Yeah, Get out of there. Like, so it's just so, it's so ridiculous. I just, I don't know. I just like, don't know how we operate like this as a society anymore. It's so crazy. Well, my, it, uh, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say my other favorite thing about this Stephen Breyer resigning is that, or retiring, whatever you want to call it is that we've now brought up this RBG thing again where she said, oh, I would really like it if they didn't nominate a Supreme Court justice w until they elect a new president. And we're once again saying that we we dishonored a dying woman's wish because they nominated a Supreme Court justice. It's like, well, because you're a Supreme Court justice doesn't mean you get to pick your successor. Yeah. Like, that's not a thing. Yeah. yeah. And I've never heard them say anything like that about Scalia. Yeah. I've never heard them say anything like that about Scalia. Yeah. Well, it's just funny because it's like, oh, yeah, we forgot the founding fathers when they wrote this. They were like, unless there's a Supreme Court justice named Ruth Bader Ginsburg, <laughs> um, you can't yeah. you can't do it. You have to do everything to her wishes. Um, just P.S. They like added that. We just missed that part. So, so, so Grant, you brought up. I I think. Did you bring up the Harvard admission policy yeah. or is that? Or I, uh, yeah. Well, we both. Yeah, yeah, OK, we well, question is both of you. So. <laughs> So I was looking at that and I actually sent a, uh, I sent a quick email to the president of Harvard yesterday. You know, he reads all my emails or it's actually, it's Drew Faust. So it's a woman. Um, but anyway, I sent a quick note about this because they sent out an email talking about how straight up their admission policy is and how there's 40 years of, of uh, Supreme court precedent behind it. And one of the things I, I asked was, is your view of, people so shallow that you think all just because someone is black he's had the same experience as all other black people do all black are all black people alike yeah i mean that's what they're saying i mean i mean that for years that was right you never said oh black people are all alike you don't say that and you don't say that because it's not true but that's exactly what affirmative action rules do they say uh, you're black. Yeah, yeah. You're representative of all black people. Come on in. There are very successful black people. And to say that every black person is at a disadvantage is to ignore the success of black people, which I think we should be celebrating when black people are successful. And to argue that they can't succeed. Yeah. That they can't. And I mean, it's just absolutely Tara. Uh, again, tell me if I'm nuts. I just, I don't think the black kid at, um, what is it? Phillips and Andover, an unbelievably elite private school. I just can't believe that that kid has that much in common with a black kid from the ghetto. Yeah. Just because they're both black. Those two people are from radically different worlds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how in the world does it help diversity well. <laughs> just by bringing in someone by virtue of their skin color? Just because the skin color is the same doesn't mean they well. have anything in common. <laughs> 
Luckily, there might be something to solve for that. It's the SATs announced that they're going to do an <laughs> adversity score. So, oh, okay. according diversity, to the, diversity, according score. to uh, yeah, or I, well, not even. I don't even. It's. I don't even think it's diversity. It's like what, if your parent had this, if your parent went to whatever, where your oh, zip it's code an is. Adversity. It's I thought adversity. you misspoke. Okay, no, I'm sorry. Adversity. An adversity score. And so they're like they're looking at your zip code now to see like based on where that is, how it was, and whatever. And it's like it's so funny because. People People always talk about the white picket fence, like look and things like that. And it's like, if your zip code can like show how how much adversity you went mm. through, you know, it's like it's like think about military kids and things yeah. like that, like being separated from a parent who's like overseas fighting yeah. and having to live through that. Like, there's so many things where just these these abstract ideas that the left focuses on truly don't make any sense because they you can't look at things on a on a piece of paper and really know exactly like mm -hmm. what a person's story is that's why when you're looking for a job or applying somewhere you do an interview mm -hmm. with the person because the per the person on the paper is much different from the person in p mm -hmm. in person so it just doesn't make sense all around i would just like to say that that just shows me how terrible the sat is and my sister took the sat this year or maybe it was last year, when it recently, and was bragging that she got a better score than me. But obviously, it was way harder when I took it six years ago. So that's why now it's just it's just not even comparable. <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> also, your sister's not nearly as white as you, so oh, that, yeah. that yeah, figured that into yeah. it somehow. I don't I don't know. Um, yeah, and you know Thomas Sowell, uh, he's a, a a black economist at the Hoover Institute. Well, he's retired now, but used to be at the Hoover Institute at uh, Stanford. You know, he has studied the affirmative action phenomena for years. He's looked at it across the globe. He's looked at it specifically in American colleges and universities. And what happens is you have really elite institutions who, because of um, uh, my brain just went out, the affirmative action, there we go, <laughs> who, because of affirmative action, they will admit underqualified minority kids. So mm -hmm. it's it, it looks great for MIT. Hey, man, we got a bunch of new minority kids in here. We've upped our quota of minority kids. It's horrible for the underqualified minority kids, though, because they flunk out. Yeah, because they weren't qualified to be in because there. Because they weren't qualified to be in there. Instead of helping them, they just make it look like they're more qualified they than take they on They take on debt. They fail out of college and may never go back to college, whereas they could have succeeded at a school that was not as elite. So the elites really the elite schools that do this there. It, it's really, really raping the, um, the the vulnerable minority populations because they're the group that can least afford to fail in college. And by admitting people who are not qualified to high level elite institutions, uh, you're setting them up for failure. And that's wrong. And the only reason they're doing that is so that the college can look good and look diverse and look um, open-minded and liberal. Yeah, it's all essentially. optics. It is all, it is all optics, and it's sacrificing young people's futures just so these institutions can look diverse. Uh, all right. I think that's it for us. Anybody have anything else? Nope. So. All right. Thank you for joining us on this Friday afternoon. We appreciate you spending time with us. We love spending time with you. Um, thank you for uh, reading our articles at westernjournal.com. Just by reading our articles and just by watching, you're supporting us. And we are so grateful for that. We're thankful for it. Um, you make this endeavor possible. We don't have a billionaire. We're just a small family-owned company. And it's because of you guys that, uh, and the grace of God that we exist. Um, if you would like to support us more directly, and I don't want to push you to, but if you feel led to, you can always go to westernjournal.com slash join. That's westernjournal.com slash join. There are uh, several ways there that you can partner with us to get out the truth, to stand for conservative, to stand for Christian values in an increasingly secular liberal world. Um, as I said, we are here every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. If you are watching us on YouTube, if you're watching us on Rumble, be sure to click the subscribe button. After you click that, a little bell will pop up. You can click that bell, and that's going to make sure that you get notified when we go live. And we will go live again Monday afternoon at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. We're looking forward to seeing you then. For now, I'm Josh Manning with Western Journal. We hope you have a great weekend.